Thank you, Russ. <coughs> You'll have to excuse me, I've almost lost my voice, but welcome to the sunny Hawke's Bay. <laughs> um, these conferences are great, you know. You, you, it seems to, you talk about cutting people's trees down and they flock in. And in fact, last night I met a lovely couple who, uh, who have been and visited their forest for the first time yesterday. I actually uh, said I wouldn't mention any names, and I won't, but it was great to see them come here and visit their forest for the first time. I'd suggest that Roger had his I can trust me face on when he sold them this year. But um, I won't mention their names, but I hope you do enjoy the wine tour of the 13 other individuals that are going there. The intention of the speakers this weekend is to give you a better understanding of our industry, and in particular the harvesting and logistics that are involved. It is our hope that you will leave with an appreciation of the task at hand. As the first speaker, I'm going to try and put into perspective the scale and the opportunity and challenges that scale presents. I will be talking with the intention of harvesting. My presentation will be based on fact, some assumption and a touch of opinion. It works. <laughs> The topics I'll be covering today, uh, introduction to the FM as a team, which Roger has already done, however I will go through it again so you can put a face to the name, forest development history, RDL volumes, log markets, wood flow continuity and contractors, harvest reports and expenses, and I will finish with a brief summary. The FMNZ team that are present at the conference today are Sally Sisson, who along with myself is a joint CEO of FMNZ. Many of you may not know Sally, but Sally has been with us since 1993 and she is pretty much the glue that holds everything together and Roger alluded you to that. Rory Benison, <coughs> who is our technical forester, uh, you will be hearing him present tomorrow, there's not much he can't do with a computer. Jason Osborne, who is our supervisor and he looks after the properties uh, from Napier and Southern Wairau. Ian Bell, he is our harvest coordinator and uh, before anyone asks, no, no relation and certainly not my partner. <laughs> She's much better looking. And from Gisborne, Nathan Wallace, many of you know Nathan, he's a manager out of our Gisborne office and Daniel Murdy our forest supervisor in that same region. So where did it all begin? Roger promoted his first forest with the establishment of Waikiri in the Taranaki region in 1989. It was followed shortly after in 1990 with Maxwell. At that point, he decided that the east coast of the North Island was the place to be, mainly due to the favourable growth rates and the infrastructure that existed. He started just north of Napier with the planting of Tangoyo and Glenview Forest and we progressively moved north, establishing the first forest in the re Gisborne region in 1995. Collectively, the entire estate had a net stocked area of 26,000 hectares and during the peak of the silviculture years, that saw 350 individuals working in the forest on a day-to-day -day basis. And if I was to look at the, the supervision work that we put in there and the quality control work, we carried out approximately 45,500 quality control plots. So quite large. A major undertaking. What is a major undertaking? I feel this is a major undertaking. An estimated recoverable volume of 16.7 million tonnes of logs at age 28. Let me put that in perspective. Compliance considerations and resource consents over six different councils and four different regions, and quite often with many different rules and regulations. 840 kilometres of new harvest ready rows to construct. And if I put a cost on that, at, uh, at se about $75,000 a K, that equates to $63 million worth of expenditure. 3,250 landings based on a density of one every eight hectares. If I was to put a cost on that, 
on an average of about $4,000 a landing, that is about $13 million worth of expenditure. 61,000 harvest days. 61,000 harvest days. If one crew was to harvest the entire estate on a standard week, you know, in a standard working week, it would take them 247 years. Doesn't that put into perspective? 576,000 truckloads end to end. Those trucks would reach Beijing and be part way back. If I was to put a cost on cartage, and cartage is a real cost, for every 50 kilometres you're away from your destination, it costs approximately eight and a half to ten thousand dollars per hectare, depending on your yield to transport those logs. So quite a major cost. And if we were to export everything, and it's most unlikely we won't, it would fill 530 ships. <clears throat> so. I'm going to run through a few graphs here. This graph is the forecast tonnes based on the prospectus at age 28. As you'll see, in 2019 it climbs up to 1 million tonnes. The following year it gets up to 2.7 million tonnes for a couple of years and then drops back off. In reality, that is impossible. There is not a management company around that could meet that requirement and build the infrastructure like that. So we have to look at smoothing. The intention with smoothing is uh, at 27 years we'd look at the road lining and we would work it on an age class distribution, so the oldest to the youngest, and once we commenced we would not stop. I've split the estate into three areas, largely around where we believe the logs will end up, but it's not definitive because we need to cost it at the time, depending on the port charges, transport, etc. Could you please turn off your phones? <laughs> um, those regions are Taranaki, Napier and Gisborne. Um, I'll start with Taranaki. The Taranaki, uh, the orange line there represents the um, forecast tonnes, the blue line the smooth volume. As you can see it still fluctuates, uh, however smaller volumes are peaking at 130,000 tonnes at 2017. Napier, um, yet again the blue line representing the forecast off the prospectus and the red line the smooth volume. You'll see in 2021 we hit 640,000 tonnes for about six years and then we drop back off. Uh, that is probably an, an ideal smooth volume. And Gisborne, the, uh, the green line representing the forecast tonnes, the, the red, the smooth volume, not too dissimilar to, to Napier, peaking in 2025 for five years and then dropping back off with a bit of a lull before it picks up again with more recently planted uh, forests. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I put all those together, it looks something like this. We, uh, we quickly climb up to just over 1.2 million tonnes, peaking at, at a, close to 1.3 in 2025 and then dropping back off. Um, we envisage to, to carry out this workload we'll need 20 to 25 good productive crews. Okay, and a good productive crew is, is you know, 270, 250 to 300 tonne a day. So, so we expect we will need those crews at the peak probably 25. My last graph, possibly graphed out, this uh, this is a monthly Agrifax graph that tracks New Zealand log prices in dollars per tonne. It shows the last 10 years and the red line there is showing that, that average. And as you can see, it's a reasonably volatile market. Like a lot of commodities, that log prices do go up and down. They tend to uh, go up slowly and drop quickly. And uh, that's the issue we've got with, with in our export market. That is largely driven by the export market but we do operate in a volatile market. And when, uh, when prices drop off, people either look for other markets or they, in the woodlot scenarios, they stop harvesting completely. In reality, uh, the, you know, the other markets that I'm talking about are domestic markets. Domestic markets set their prices usually quarterly. Export markets are monthly. 
and uh, when they drop off, you, you, look, you look to that domestic market. And we're extremely lucky to have Pampac here, and we do nurture that relationship with Pampac. They're a, they're a big log user. We know that their catchment area is quite large. We're currently harvesting in the wire wrapper, and uh, we're sending prune logs back to them. So the catchment area is quite large. I suspect when they get a bigger resource here, the catchment area may reduce a little bit, but um, it, you know we do welcome that, that domestic market, and, uh, and it's a, it is a positive thing. Wood flow and continuity. As an individual investor, you have one chance to harvest, and I know you all want the peak prices. However, as you have seen from the previous slide, we're operating in a volatile market where prices fluctuate. Costs are the enemy. To a large degree, we cannot control the market prices, so savings need to be had through reductions in expenditure. Economy of scale provides major cost savings. In order to achieve the harvest successfully and to reduce expenses, we need to show consistency and maintain continuity in wood flow. As a large group, we can manage our expenses better and by providing continuity, we'll demand cost savings. An example of that is a harvest crew that uh, you provide continuity to will save you three to five dollars a tonne in harvest rate. To date, you have enjoyed the economy of scale the RDL Group has offered, and uh, now that we're getting towards the largest expenses, it is vital you capitalise on that group scale again. Harvesting requirements. The professional contract workforce is the key to the success of the harvest and will provide better returns through value recovery and peace rates. The harvest schedule, it is expected that the harvest schedule based on the smooth volume will require 20 to 25 crews. We envisage this to be made up of five or six prime contractors. While we're looking for those professional contractors, others will be too. In order for us to engage them, we simply need to have stability. And as was talked about earlier, there's a lot of wood coming on stream and we need to have that stability to engage those crews. Professional and competent contractors will reduce exposure to environmental and health and safety liabilities. Contractors, professional contractors will take pride in their job and have a positive impact from an environmental perspective and from a health and safety aspect they will have robust systems that they adhere to. The new WorkSafe legislation demands accountability from you as owners and us as managers. We're moving from an audit-based system to a procedural-based system where everyone is accountable for their actions or their inactions. The legislation carries fines of $600,000 or five years imprisonment. Currently, I'd suggest that there's not a forest management company who's not reviewing the health and safety systems, and if they're not, they should be. As a company, we welcome this change because we believe it'll get rid of the cowboys from our industry, and it's those cowboys that give our industry a bad name. This new legislation will come into effect next year, and it is essential we engage and retain professional contractors. We regularly get asked about the harvest and the harvest timelines. <coughs> so for a typical 250 hectare forest, this is how we see it. Basically at age 24, we'd start the pre-harvest inventory. That'll let us know what the, re the expected recoverable volumes are and the grade outturns are gonna be. At age 25 and 26, we start engaging with stakeholders and, uh, and, and start the uh, harvest plan. Stakeholders such as, um, you probably can see them there, um, regional council, markets, iwi, neighbours, community, and the list goes on. At age 26 and 27, we'd start implementing the road lining, start building the infrastructure to move into the main harvest. 
And at age 27 to 29, like I say, this is for a 250-hectare property, we would implement the main harvest. Another question we regularly get asked. Who pays? How does it, how does, how does it work? So funded by future share calls. Pre-harvest inventory, harvest planning and resource consent. And the main reason for that is because these items um, usually happen one or two years prior to the harvesting. Funded by log sales, all other infrastructure in regards to that, that, uh, that harvesting. Logging, the road, the road lining, the cartage, all fees. You'll also note at the very end there, we, we've got re-establishment. So I'm just going to quickly talk on re-establishment. Forest re-establishment, replanting will take place the following winter as harvest proceeds. So for your typical 250 hectare forest, that will be about two to three years, and what that means is you're going to end up with a multi-aged forest. Replanting in some situations is a mandatory requirement. Under resource consents, sometimes it is a requirement that we replant the area within 18 months. And uh, under the ETS for pre-1990 obligations, we sometimes do have an obligation to replant. Now, most of you are post-89, however, there is parts of the estate that have got pre-1990 obligations. With that being said, leaving the land fellow is not an option and can lead to increased costs and reduced land value. It is our intention to replant. Right, back, back onto the harvesting and uh, monthly reports. We will be, once we move into that harvesting, we, we uh, provide a monthly report and uh, it will cover the progress of the harvest. It will cover all income, including the, you know, the cost and the grades. It will cover all expenditure um, for harvesting, roading, all the cartage, anything to do with that harvest, anything that is spent is in that report. It will cover market commentaries, and um, you know, generally around your domestic and export markets. It is a very easy read document, and it has to be very, tr and, and we actually pride ourselves on our transparency. And at this point, I was gonna say that there's a couple out by our banners for you to have a look at. However, someone's decided they want them more than we do, and they were example ones, so unfortunately they're not there. So if someone has got them, if you could return them to our banner for other people to look at, that'd be great. <coughs> right, summary, am I right for time? Good. In summary, we cannot control the markets, they are what they are. We can, however, control the costs, and through scale and continuity, we will achieve the best results. We cannot turn off and on as markets fluctuate. We can, however, manipulate the volumes by slowing the operations during market downturns, and that is the real key to holding your infrastructure. So when the market is low, we reduce the volumes. To engage with professional contractors, we need to show consistency in that workload. Smoothing of the volume is vital and the only way we will successfully complete the harvest. Through the smoothing process, we will average out the forest return and it is the best mechanism to ensure the harvest infrastructure is developed. To date, you have enjoyed the benefit of the group through our silver culture years and insurance policies, to name a couple. Now that we're at the business end of the rotation, we need commitment to the harvest. With the group, you will command significant savings. And lastly, I'm gonna reflect back. I remember my uh, first job here for Jeff Reddington in 1992, survival counting out at Tungoyo in Glenview. And uh, it seems shortly after that, we moved into the silver culture years. And in uh, 1999, we had a program of over 12,000 hectares of pruning and thinning. Some people said we wouldn't do it, and we did. Being involved in your partnerships since their inception has given Sally and I both a sense of pride and achievement. And as we move towards the harvest, we, uh, both Sally and I and the FMNZ team, look forward to the opportunity and the challenge of completing the task. The uh, I am going to say, you know, the, uh, the conference here, this is your conference, it's for your knowledge, this is why we put it on, and uh, I encourage you to engage with the professionals that are in this room. 
today and tomorrow. The last thought I'm going to leave you with is this. This is the young man waiting for the expenses to reduce and log markets to rise. <laughs> Thank you.